Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Ruthless Dog and Pony Show. Um, my name is Julio Panicello. I am the dream alchemist at Ruthless Painters, a free range art school, atelier, and gallery uh, for creative nomads. Uh, we're here because every two weeks we present our next the theme of our next painting collection so you'll be able to find out what we will be painting uh, next and also the reason why this is episode 71 so um, and it's the th third episode of 2022 so yeah we've been doing this for uh, a very long time it feels and uh, and that's very good so um, we will explain uh, where the painting theme comes from and how it relates to our contemporary life. We um, use images of paintings uh, as uh, a way to illustrate uh, the reason behind the theme and also to provide some examples, um, visual examples of how the theme uh, has been painted throughout art history. Um, so yeah, we explore different possibilities for visual representation of the concept that we're going to present using images of paintings throughout art history as inspiration while citing stylistic and historical references. And thanks for being here and thanks Lois for, for being here because this relates a little bit to you in a way. Um, so you can find all the episodes on um, Instagram and also on our YouTube channel. We have a bunch and they're free to watch. Uh, we have um, the episodes as podcasts as well in any podcast platform. So you're welcome to listen to this presentation uh, while you do something of importance. Uh, so you're welcome to reach out to comment uh, with a contact, I mean, with a uh, to contact us with a comment uh, in case you want to contribute to the presentation with um, a thought, an opinion, or a fact that you know uh, will make it better. We stand uh, to be corrected. Um, we're going to dedicate two weeks for this next painting collection. This is also an open call for anyone who wants to participate in the painting collection with a painting uh, based on the concept. So um, we would love for you to attend our in-person and remote sessions, but you can also do your version on your own and then um, share it with us. So I think that's it. Let me just kind of like start. We'll keep this under um, 30, uh, 30 minutes uh, before Okay, I'm not going to give it a, uh, away so easily, but I just wanted to say that this past week, uh, Kathy uh, came to paint at Trails Cafe um, on one of the Tuesdays that we go there. We go there every Tuesday from noon to two, and she um, visited the Redlands, and she spent some time in... Um, orchard, uh, orange um, groves, essentially, orange groves. So she brought a gift to Jen and I and other people in the session. Uh, she brought oranges, oranges and lemons. And it was a very beautiful uh, offering. And it's, we're just um, appreciating physical offerings much more these days than ever before. So it was nice because we know it's citrus season we're trying to find an orchard um, with orange groves where we could just go and paint. We think we will be able to announce one uh, location uh, sometime this week. Um, but this was the beginning of the, uh, the journey towards uh, the theme of the painting collection, which will be oranges. So once we got that offering. Sometimes you know how the universe works. Uh, one thing leads to another and then it seems like you know all the dots are out there so it was easy for us to connect them because I think it was a day uh, a few days later 
Lois, you uh, have been working on uh, painting with oranges and uh, that was another dot uh, <laughs> from the universe. So we connected the fruit offering with that painting. Um, and I think I'm just going to come up with something else that I had in mind. But having said that, um, this is what we're going to paint this next two weeks. Um, oranges, uh, still lives with oranges or oranges uh, in the trees, uh, whether you take photos of um, citrus trees uh, or you arrange oranges um, somewhere and somehow and you take a picture of those or you want to paint them from life. So um, we're going to paint oranges. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to share, it's a, I think it's probably the oldest, one of the oldest paintings. You're familiar with this painting. I, um, I, th I think, um, let me just uh, get a very brief information. The Arnold Finney portrait, uh, this was painted in 1434, an oil painting by Jan van Eyck. I believe that's the way it's pronounced. Um, so it's in the National Gallery in London. So it's a, if you ever go there, it's free and it's open. So this is a magical painting that's there that uh, contains a lot of symbols and um, some art historians uh, have describe this painting as a visual marriage contract uh, because of the uh, huge amount of uh, uh, symbols in the painting and also writing on the painting that uh, affirm or yeah legalize I guess the marriage between these two people um, but I just brought this because in the painting there are oranges they're oranges on the window right next to um, on the left side of the uh, dude <laughs> getting married there are oranges on the window uh, sill there's one orange on the window sill and then there are a couple of oranges uh, just below and I'm just gonna show if I yes so this is a close-up of the painting and you can see the orange the single orange on the windowsill and the oranges on the floor or on top of a, a piece of furniture so um yeah let me just uh, go to my notes and I will just mention that oranges are a symbol of fertility um, and union and that's why uh, there were uh, depicted there and let me find out uh, one second I'm just gonna read that note about the oranges uh, here uh, the oranges which lie on the windowsill and chest so the piece of furniture it's a chest may symbolize the purity and innocence that re reigned in the Garden of Eden before the fall of man they were uncommon and a sign of wealth in the Netherlands uh, but in Italy, we're a symbol of fecundity and marriage, in marriage. Uh, more simply, the fruit could be a sign of the couple's wealth, since oranges were very expensive imports. And this leads us to talk about how this symbol of wealth was um, uh, a way of uh, visually represent the American dream when oranges were brought uh, from Europe uh, to America, to the United States, by um, whoever uh, the monks or the religious figures were. So it was uh, seen, or oranges at the time were seen as a symbol of wealth and also of promise and also of um, opportunity. So uh, they were first uh, grown in Florida and then uh, in Southern California. So I think in the uh, 1800s I believe um, let me see if I can find uh, that but uh, so these are the two um, oldest or the oldest representation of oranges that we found of the mid 1400s and, and they were depicted in the um, famous 
uh, Arnolfini portrait by Van Eyck. And we have other example of oranges. Um, fast forward uh, to uh, this painting by Rousseau. Uh, Henri Rousseau, he painted apes in the orange grove in 1910. We thought this was a good example of using the theme of oranges, but not just as a still life, but uh, as part of a landscape. Another example of uh, painting with oranges would be this uh, piece by um, a basket of oranges portrait of George McKay MacDonald by um, Edward Robert Hughes. Ed Edward Robert Hughes uh, born in 1851 and until 1914, he was a British painter who primarily worked with watercolors. This is a watercolor painting. I mean, yes, it's a watercolor painting. So he was uh, not one of the pre-Raphaelite uh, painters, but uh, he was influenced by them and you can... Um, you can see on the face of the figure uh, how this has like pre-Raphaelite Raphaelite, um, uh, stylized features. It's, uh, we love this painting uh, because uh, it's so ambiguous. Um, the figure, the face of the figure, the portrait, the gender of the portrait, it's so ambiguous. But anyhow, a different example and also um, a different use of oranges in a painting uh, always carrying that symbolism of promise, opportunity, um, wealth uh, as well. Um, so another example, and I'm just going to bring a modern example of a painting. Uh, this is by a Bulgarian artist. Uh, she's still alive. Uh, her, her name is Dora Boneva, still alive with oranges and agave. So... Uh, a, a more of a modern version in which uh, there is uh, a still life with other objects, uh, a succulent, and then uh, three oranges. So the idea for this uh, collection would be to have uh, oranges as a centerpiece for uh, the painting, but um, not necessarily as a single uh, focal point, although this could be an option, but um, with the possibility of creating from the still life to something that incorporates landscape uh, and even architectural elements. So uh, I'm going to continue sharing some uh, images to give you other ideas. This is by Richard uh, Dibbenkorn, uh, actually, uh, the American um, painter uh, this was painted in 1955, Still Life with Orange Peel by Richard Diebenkorn. Uh He was an American painter between 1922 and 1993, associated with abstract expressionism and also with the Bay Area figurative um, movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. And this obviously painted in 1955 belongs to the period in which he was more uh, representational and use uh, uh, figuration to translate uh, reality and then he after the 1960s he just kind of like moved on to a more uh, abstract uh, language visual language but um, this we thought this was an interesting approach of painting uh, uh, oranges an orange one orange full by itself, an orange peel, and combining, um, I wouldn't say architectural, but in a way, maybe the word applies here. Um, vertical versus horizontal versus round elements, uh, very interesting point of view, upright, um, on the surface, and with a very interesting color palette. So the playing with scale, uh, small objects uh, over a larger surface and simplifying the background uh, as a way of creating perspective, but not being interested in um, 
creating a lot of detail. So this could be a compositionally good example. Uh, hopefully this will be an inspiration for uh, how to arrange or how to set up um, uh, an image or rather uh, a scene with oranges. So um, let's kind of like move forward and we have, oh, this is like so interesting. Oh, well, first of all, this is a Henri Matisse painting, which is really weird. Uh, they look like egg yolks. So one of the things that um, we love, apart from going in uh, back combing uh, art history and finding uh, artists that were left behind or ignored, it's also uh, finding uh, paintings uh, by well-known artists that are w weird or ugly. I wouldn't say this is an ugly painting, but certainly it's a weird painting by Matisse that, um, you know, we're not used to uh, seeing. Uh, it's not a, uh, a well-known piece, I would say. A Vase with Oranges by Henri Matisse, painted in 1916. It's a post-impressionist or in post-impressionist uh, style. Um, this is the painting, it's not cropped. This is, this is it, this is the whole thing. So for starters, uh, this very interesting forced, cropped uh, arrangement of the subject uh, matter, um, it's really weird. And the oranges, um, they feel like uh, almost like oversized lentils, not really uh, oranges. They're they're not um, in front of each other. They don't create this idea of uh, perspective. Um, they're they have uh, uh, or, or, or um, Matisse work with tangencies here, whether he did it in purpose or not. I don't think he did it in purpose. But uh, the fruit is arranged um, almost geometrically. There's no uh, variation in the composition. Uh, there is a slice of orange at the bottom, but it looks like an apple and it's really tiny. And um, there's no distinction between uh, horizontal surface and background. So as far as we're concerned, we don't know if this is a table or not. So there are very, uh, strange but captivating at the same time features on this very weird Matisse and we're gonna go from weird Matisse to ugly ugly Van Gogh because um, we love to pick on uh, Van Gogh for the pieces that uh, he made that they're not so great <laughs> and we don't have anything against Van Gogh but it's nice to see that uh, uh, this really revered painters had some weird stuff going on so this is, Van Gogh wasn't precisely well known for painting babies or children. Uh, he always did um, <laughs> a really miserable job. But at the same time, this is not a criticism because uh, as painters, we know that painting children is just really hard and not precisely the most uh, rewarding of experiences. We end up painting um, babies and children in a way that make them look like... Uh, 90-year-old uh, people. So this is uh, the Van Gogh version of painting a child that looks like an old person. Um, this painting, uh, and by all means, apologies for the uh, technical difficulties, but we're back. So uh, this is titled Child with Orange by Vincent van Gogh, uh, dated uh, 1890, so towards the end of his life, and he painted it in uh, the hospital where he stayed. Um, yeah, so this was part of a group of paintings uh, during that period that reflect his life um, behind um, uh, behind the wall, <laughs> I would say, uh, physically and also emotionally. Uh, Nothing to say here, just like uh, pointing it out, it's a very unusual Van Gogh, or at least not very, uh, a very unseen Van Gogh. Um, and we talked about uh, the weird children that he depicted, and this is part of that collection, but uh, he had something about painting uh, the cheeks of babies with lots of red or magenta. Um, so 
uh, it just almost looks like this baby has some orange paint uh, smeared on her face uh, from the orange. So another example of and uh, and in, in in regards of like um, depicting the actual orange, this is only a round circle or a circle, and it's painted flat. There's no a gradation of value. There's no scale. There's no intention of painting texture on the skin. Uh, there's no, um, I wouldn't say effort because obviously there is a lot of effort, but there's no uh, interest in just uh, creating uh, uh, rhythmic um, integration between the hands holding and the object having like a physical weight. Uh, it, it, as far as we're concerned, this could be an orange disc, a frisbee, a mini frisbee that the child is ready kind of like to throw. Um, after painting um, his face with orange paint. Um, but um, anyhow, so we, you know, as going back to uh, different styles, we talked about egg from egg yolks to frisbee. So, um, oh, well, let's just talk about some serious business. Berthe Morisot had a beautiful example of um, orange theme painting. Uh, this is the, it's titled The Orange Picker by Berthe Morisot, uh, 1889. And we haven't seen this painting before, but this is, has all the amazingness and sophistication and incredible uh, command of the brush uh, by this painter that we love so much, uh, much superior than any of the Impressionists, but sort of like swept under the rug for um, reasons we're going to leave out. Uh, in this presentation because we only have like eight minutes left um, but um, this is a great way to incorporate landscape uh, subject matter and a figure um, her use of color palette is so um, beautiful uh, transparency glazes uh, opacity versus transparency sorry for the redundant term but she was a a complete um, uh, she was very proficient in um, widening the range of the brushstroke to create uh, um, a aesthetic experience beyond what she would represent. So this is not just about painting a figure, picking an orange. It's about displaying this rich um, visual language to uh, transport us beyond uh, the scene being told. So it, it's, uh, Beth Moiso wasn't a storyteller, uh, in our opinion. She was um, uh, infatuated by the possibilities of painting and um, the usage of, if you think orange and purple, can they go well together? Uh, it's a combination of colors that we never think of in regards to uh, combining colors that go well together, orange and purple. Uh, and yet, you know, the way she combined those two colors here, it's just so beautiful. Uh, so, um, and finally, do we have some, well, yeah, we have some uh, other Van Gogh. Uh, oranges where fruits in, in general, fruits, flowers, where um, objects of desire, um, for painters to depict on in, in on their uh, paintings. So we're back. This is <laughs> a painting of Van Gogh. Uh, there's something going on, but um, thanks for being so patient. So still life with oranges and lemons with blue gloves. And it's um, oh, sometimes, you know, some uh, titles sort of like open the door to something exciting about the painting. I, we didn't see the blue gloves uh, before we actually uh, read the title. So uh, there's something about the gloves in front of the uh, basket uh, that make make them look like they're part of the foliage on the background. So these cold notes, um, there is a certain continuity um, from above the basket uh, to below the basket. So um, it's nice that uh, Van Gogh's way to um, point at uh, another focal point in the painting was by actually naming it on the title. Uh, Still Life with Oranges and Lemons, with Blue Gloves, and there is, if you notice that the citrus 
uh, fruit, the oranges, um, there is a little bit more interest here in depicting the uneven um, contour of the fruit. Uh, there is a little bit more interest in um, changing the value of color, uh, creating cast shadows. So I think uh, this was painted 1889. No, it's kind of like a really similar time as before uh, as the painting of the child with a little frisbee and um oh well yeah this is this is um something we're going to conclude the presentation with this painting this is of uh zurbaran francisco de zurbaran a spanish painter and we're ending here because uh this painting is at the huntington um, I'm sorry, uh, the Norton Simon, uh, the Norton Simon owns this uh, amazing painting and it's not really big and it's not uh, the most famous painting at the Norton Simon because everyone goes to the Norton Simon to see uh, Degas ballerinas and stuff like that, but certainly it's worth the visit alone. Um, so because of this, uh, we are gonna, I'm gonna just uh, essentially leave the house and then go to the Norton Simon because I need to see this painting. Uh, this was painted in, eight, in 1633, sorry, uh, uh, 1633, um, typical Spanish Baroque, uh, I should say. Um, and yes, we love how contemporary this feels uh, in regards to uh, the usage of black and to create drama uh, a way of like making the light much more operatic on the scene and also the fact that uh, the use of color it's very uh, interesting it's not highly saturated and things are um, very muted um, they, they, they just feel like almost monochromatic with a little uh, watercolor glaze on top of it which is not the case because it's an oil painting and so much to be learned about this piece, but perhaps uh, this is uh, the effect of time. Um, uh, so chromatically, uh, this m maybe they were a little bit more pigmented, but uh, maybe not. Um, it's very um, Velasquez-like. Um, so we'll find out more about uh, this particular painting and others. There are tons of examples tomorrow in our uh, live stream, in our webinar, please. Go to our website, rooflesspainters.com, and check out the calendar. Our session is already there. We're painting oranges because it's citrus season, because we got um, this wonderful offering by Kathy, and also because it's a symbol of wealth and abundance and opportunity. And I think um, it's the perfect follow-up for the glass of water uh, from last couple of weeks to symbolize um you know uh the interest or the focus on health and health related issues so maybe we can go from uh the health component to uh the wealth component and sort of like uh paint oranges as an offering and an affirmation for uh us wanting to uh create some abundance around ourselves <laughs> Um, well, thanks. Thanks so much for uh, joining, for your comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, yes, Amanda. It's true. There's a family connection. So, uh, Berthe Morisot, uh, the niece of Fragonard, uh, that's right. And she did marry Monet's, uh, was it Manet? Was it Manet or Monet? I think it was Monet's brother. Uh, I'm not sure. But, uh, and yes, Laura, uh, let's go to the Norton Simon. I'll meet you there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see this painting, uh, live again. Um, I think I, um, haven't been to the Norton Simon in a while, but it would be interesting to just go back there and discover, rediscover this painting. Um, so Two weeks um, to paint oranges. We'll bring um, images of oranges, uh, photographs of oranges with different um, arrangements, compositions um, on tables, um, on countertops, uh, as decorative pieces, but also on trees. So 
um, before we conclude, we have maybe like 30 seconds. Uh, the word orange um, comes from um, the old French uh, pomme d'orange, uh, which comes from the Latin pomum di orange from Italian arancia. Uh, and then that Italian ar arancia comes from uh, uh, Venetian, Venetian uh, naranza. Uh, you know, in Italy, there were a lot of kingdom kingdoms of the, uh, at the time when this happened. Um, and that word comes from the Arabic naranj. And the word naranj uh, comes from Persian narang. So we're just going back in time. And then the Persian word narang um, uh, originated after the Sanskrit word narangas, so, which means orange tree. And uh, so the word hasn't changed much uh, ever since Sanskrit. Uh, orange trees uh, were uh, in, first cultivated in uh, Southeast um, Asia, uh, parts of India and China. And uh, the actual orange, it's not a wild uh, fruit, it's a hybrid. Uh, we didn't know that. The orange, the sweet orange, it's part pomelo and part mandarin. So it's a hybrid that originated uh, hundreds of years ago. I think uh, the first um, reference uh, in literature was in Chinese literature in 314 BC. So um, the, all the oranges that we are eating today, all the sweet oranges, there are many species, but they all originate from uh, this hybrid between pomelo and mandarin uh, mixed together. So it's not a wild fruit, it's a domesticated fruit. And uh, also, uh, very interesting. The color orange was named after the fruit before uh, the um, uh, name of the color um, orange was uh, sort of like applied to uh, the color. Uh, uh, the color name was uh, yellow red or no red yellow or something like that. Red yellow or yellow red. And sometimes people use the word saffron, saffron in order to uh, a name uh, uh, that sh that shade of color, but um, I forgot where I, where I had the reference. But we're gonna talk about it tomorrow. There was a point in which someone used the word orange to designate to name uh, that color, and then it switched from uh, being named um, saffron or yellow red to being named orange. So, and. It's a fruit that it's particular because in the same tree, you cannot pick up the fruit when it's green. So uh, unlike other fruit trees that uh, get uh, harvested when the fruit is green and then they let it ripe in um, other places, you have to pick the orange when it's ripe. You cannot pick it when it's green. And we are learning that there are laws in many states, one of them California, that forbids to pick green oranges from a tree. Uh, we don't know if it's because of um, some health issues or it's an ancient uh, or old rule, but yes. And in addition to that, it has to be picked when it's ripe. It also, uh, uh, it has the, parti uh, the particular aspect of having both flowers and fruits um, on the tree at the same time. So it doesn't really follow the first the fruit and then the, I mean, sorry, first the flower and then the tree rule. Uh, it can flower and fruit uh, at the same time. And that's one of the reasons why this was uh, used as a symbol of fertility uh, because of that combination of both things happening at the same time. Um, and Okay, that's uh, too much information already, but thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow. Uh, the webinar will be up for um, uh, sale after tomorrow also. Please join us. Uh, this could be a great follow-up for the glass of water. And uh, let's do this. And I can wait uh, tomorrow to work with Jen and uh, pull some more information about uh, the subject so we can learn much more and perhaps uh, uh, 
conclude the two week uh, period of time with a visit uh, to an orchard here in Southern California so we can actually paint the oranges from life, which we're working on it. All right. Bye, everyone.